Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, you are live with the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Abby Huffman. I'm Director of Programs. I'm going to be your host tonight. So every Thursday night, we try to give you a topic that is something a little different, maybe a perspective you haven't heard before. And tonight is no different. We just really want to thank you so much for supporting the mission of ACHS. You might have heard we're going to be building a new museum. We're going to be having our um, collections and archives, and we are so excited to hopefully next year have some in-person programming. So stay tuned for that. But for now, this evening, I would like to um, welcome our speaker. We have licensed battlefield guide Jeff Harding with us, who's going to tell us a story that some have heard, but maybe some haven't heard quite this way. So Jeff, without further ado, if you'd take the, take the stage. Absolutely, Abby. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone at the Adams County Historical Society for hosting me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my uh, story of my book with everyone out there this evening. So thank you. Gettysburg's Lost Love Story, the ill-fated romance of General John Reynolds and Kate Hewitt. So before we get into it, let me just take a quick second and, and thank you for mentioning my work as a guide. Abby, it's my 23rd year, which I can't really believe, but 23rd year of guiding in, in Gettysburg. Uh, I've been working, uh, of course, for many years as a freelance historian and author, uh, leadership consultant and motivational speaker. And I mentioned here to, uh, on the path of history, solving mysteries. It's something that uh, kind of it uh, gets the juices flowing. I like to look into things that uh, people maybe haven't looked into uh, fully and uh, probably no greater example uh, right now than, than uh, the fruits of my labor with this book. And um, I always like to uh, mention uh, at the very beginning, my research associate, Mary Pitkin, who uh, we published an article in Civil War Times back in August of 2020 when we first discovered Kate Hewitt's true fate. Um, so I'd like to share uh, a lot of credit with Mary for digging into this with me. Uh, but I was able to take what we did and develop it a bit more and bring in John Reynolds' side of the story and put the book together. So this evening, what I'd like to do uh, over the course of about the next 30 minutes at the most here uh, is, is share with you my experience. And, uh, you know, the, usually it's who, what, why, where, when and how. And I'm changing it up a little. We're going with why and how, who, where, when and what. But that's the best way to unfold uh, the story of me writing this book and more importantly, the book itself for everybody. And an old adage with guiding is, you know, uh, you, you got two hours on the battlefield with people and you can't tell them everything. Uh, so don't try to. Uh, and of course, we uh, we keep that in mind. So same thing with uh, any presentation I do with the book. I have so many things and I was looking over some notes last night and I get into the book and start revisiting some of the research and there's a million details I want to share. Uh, there's never an opportunity to share all those and, and maybe that's just as well, but I'll try to share as many as I can within the allotted time and, and not overwhelm everybody. So why and how? Why and how did I get drawn into the story? I want to share that with you. And then we'll talk a little bit about who. Of course, the, the, the main uh, focus of the book is uh, General John Fulton Reynolds and his uh, fiance, seeker fiance, Catherine, Kate Hewitt, and then uh, where and when, some of the details uh, before, during, and after their relationship for both of them. Uh, that's some of the focus that I'd like to spend some time on. And then really revisit at the end what I learned, because what I learned is what you'll learn. If you get the book, you'll know everything I did, uh, certainly through the narrative that's in the book and then all the uh, end notes as well. So with that, let's uh, jump to the next slide here. Uh, why and how? Why and how? So most of you that are familiar with uh, John Reynolds are going to recognize this picture right away on uh, on the screen here of John, and that shows him when he uh, came to take over as uh, uh, as commandant out at uh, West Point, and um, then on the other side of the screen, what you have is William Reynolds, William Reynolds, uh, his brother, older brother, who had gone the other way, if you will, he went Navy. So uh, it's interesting uh, that uh, you have two really prominent individuals in United States history, uh, one Army, one Navy. And to me, those things are of keen interest uh, with regard to the battle. There are any number of Navy Gettysburg connections. I've published an article on this in Naval History Magazine, um, working on a book on this subject, as a matter of fact. And while I was working on the chapter of the book that had to do with the connection between John and William, 
I started to uh, take a little deeper dive into the story of John and Kate uh, with the idea to maybe do a little sidebar on that, uh, tell everybody about that. And of course, known the story for years. Uh, but the more I looked into it, the more I realized it was uh, certainly open ended as far as what uh, ultimately happened to Kate Hewitt. And the more things I read, especially online, the more I realized, uh, no surprise to everyone, it's a wild, wild west. Uh, any number of versions of the story were out there. Some of the details certainly uh, seemed uh, a little uh, suspect. And so I wanted to go into this and go back to uh, things that have been written, published, and, uh, and dig into it as much as possible. So that's what spurred it. And the other part of uh, what drew my interest to this is as a guide, uh, one of the first stories you're going to tell on the battlefield, uh, first day's battlefield, stop number one. Uh, for many of the guys, this is where you begin your tour, other than coming away from the, the visitor center and what have you through town. When you get to the field, you're going to talk about the first day's action. And you cannot talk about the action on the first day at Gettysburg without talking about John Reynolds. And so uh, we'll go to the spot at stop one and talk about where Reynolds was uh, unfortunately killed. Untimely death there, leading troops into action uh, on the first day of the battle, beginning phase of the battle. So you see the images here, a tree that had an R carved in it to let everybody know uh, the general vicinities of where Reynolds was killed. That's 1867 time frame. Uh, one of the veterans did that, um, that was with him at the time he was killed. And then there's a monument put up, uh, a marker, if you will, 1886 to show where he fell. That's on the other side of the screen. And then the beautiful equestrian monument, Henry Cook, Kirk Bush Brown, 1899, uh, showing Reynolds. Um, on his trusted steed fancy on the field at Gettysburg for eternity. So um, knowing that this is one of the first stories we share, uh, I felt that it's critically important to, to get this right and share it with as many people as I could um, as far as Reynolds experience there, but ultimately his engagement to Kate Hewitt um, and what happened to her. And that was the biggest mystery ever since we found that he was secretly engaged to her is what was her ultimate fate and wanted to know that. So that's how I went down the road to the why and the how. Now I say never forget what they did here. That's a quote, of course, from President uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. The world will little note or long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And I always find it ironic, and I mention this uh, on almost every tour to the folks that are with me, is you know why are people coming back to Gettysburg? And nine times out of 10, it's because unfortunately they did forget what happened here. And the irony is they remembered Lincoln's speech. Uh, people are still uh, memorizing it, reciting it in schools all across the country. And uh, what happened? How did they forget? Well, I think the numbers are overwhelming. I think the numbers are significant and that should help you remember what happened here. But a lot of times numbers don't get it for people. You need the stories too. But let's take a look at these numbers just for a minute. And I tip my hat to Tom Desjardin, wrote a book a number of years ago, 2003, These Honored Dead. And in that book, he drew out a, a really interesting comparison of, of the, the numbers at the time of the battle versus today. So for instance, you've probably looked at this while I'm chatting. Total troops at Gettysburg, 163,000, give or take, depending on what source you're looking at. Today's equivalent, we're gonna look at somewhere over a million and a half people, up to 1.7 million people to have a battle that big that big today, we would need that many people to equate to what it was in 1863 at the Battle of Gettysburg in terms of numbers of soldiers present for the battle. Now, casualties at Gettysburg, the number most used, 51,000. Today's equivalent, we need 500,000 casualties in a three-day battle to equate to Gettysburg. Total deaths, somewhere 10 to 15,000. We don't know the exact number. There are still soldiers unaccounted for from the battle, but most numbers bring it up close to 10. And then if you look at those that died later on of disease or in prison camps, what have you, those unaccounted for, we could be upwards of 15,000. What's that mean today? That means 100,000 to 150,000. Can you fathom a battle in three days where we would lose upwards of 150,000? Hard to get your mind around all of this in three days. So how, you ask yourself, how can you forget? Well, again, I go back to the fact that the numbers are certainly striking, uh, but they don't necessarily help people remember things. What helps us remember? Stories. Stories help us remember. For my money, there's no greater story on this battlefield, really, 
than the poignant story surrounding General John Fulton Reynolds, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, native, went to West Point, uh, serves in the Army in peacetime, the Mexican War, on frontier duty. Uh, and then, of course, Civil War breaks out. He's going to leave West Point and take over an infantry unit and ultimately uh, be a brigade leader in the Civil War division commander and First Corps. And then on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg, a wing commander in charge of three Army Corps uh, as they approach Gettysburg. And then there's his death that I've alluded to previously and his legacy. So this is the who of it now, the who of the story we're gonna be talking about. And first and foremost, it's John Reynolds. But then it's Catherine Mary, Kate Hewitt. Most know her as Kate, so I'll refer to her as Kate in the book. Now, I mentioned here Owego, Owego, New York, orphan. That's something that there was a lot of confusion about. Some had her in Owego, some had her in Oswego. If you look at the primary sources available where she indicated where she was from, you'll see why there was some confusion. But uh, in researching this with Mary Pitkin and then on, on my own, we were able to determine certainly that she's from Owego. She is indeed an orphan. She tells John Reynolds' family she's an orphan. And um, she later goes out to California, San Francisco as a governess. Uh, she has a bit of a misadventure and scandal in Sacramento. We'll get into all this in a few minutes. Uh, there's salvation yet for her uh, converting to Catholicism and uh, there's the engagement to John Reynolds. And then ultimately the tragedy where he dies on the battlefield. Now this is when Kate will unfold the story for the family of their secret engagement. And we'll get into that. Uh, Daughters of Charity, she had made a promise to John, a very poignant promise. If he were to be killed during the war, she would seek a religious life. And that's where the Daughters of Charity comes into play. And then the lasting mystery, and I say solved here. So there's a couple of things here that are important. Uh, all of it's important, but important to point out that this uh, Sacramento misadventure and scandal, something we had not known. And history often takes you to places maybe where you didn't think you were going to go, maybe where you didn't want to go. But uh, as historians, you have to cover what you find. And uh, if you validate it, unfold that for anyone who's willing to uh, to listen and understand the complete story. And then the lasting mystery, of course, talks about finding uh, Kate's ultimate fate. Where in the wind? Where in the wind? Gettysburg's lost love story. And so this is where we're going to talk about John's life. And um, as a Lancaster youth, Lancaster, excuse me, West Point, Mexican War, Army life, Civil War, Gettysburg, um, certainly uh, Kate's life before John, um, birthplace, youth, education, California years, I just mentioned a few minutes ago. And then uh, the fateful sojourn when they uh, got on board a ship together to come back uh, to the East Coast from California. She coming back for her religious conversion. Uh, John coming back to uh, Philip Roll at West Point right prior to the Civil War. Uh, her conversion, the timing of their engagement, things we're going to discuss. Her life after John, Daughters of Charity, Discover of Her True Faith, Final Resting Place. And then I mentioned here 85 plus images in the book. This is something that's uh, really important to me because I worked very hard to include uh, meaningful imagery in the book. So uh, right off the bat on the cover, uh, there's a first time image uh, ever published of Kate Hewitt. Many rare images in the book. Uh, first ever artist impression of John's West Point ring and uh, never before published image of Kate I mentioned, but also image that had been published to Kate, uh, but no one knew it was Kate uh, in the Devil's Den. Uh, and so I got that in the book. She's there with John Reynolds' family, able to, uh, to um, do some analysis there of the photography and determine that was indeed Kate. Historic handkerchief, that's a handkerchief Kate had sewn for John, unable to give it to him. He died before she was able to do so. He gave it to um, his orderly, Charles Vale, and uh, that handkerchief, much talked about, little seen, photograph of it in the book, and even a rare image of Charles Vale. Most of the images you'll see him is when he's an older uh, gentleman, but this is uh, when he's young, and so really neat, neat image. But uh, what I want to do is uh, point out to you that in the book, um, the thought was initially we would talk just about Kate, but kind of hard to tell a love story without both sides of the story. So we brought John into the story. And certainly there's been um, a lot of coverage of John Reynolds over the years. Uh, landmark biography, 1850s, Edward Nichols, wonderful book and a stands the test of time. And then Mike Riley did a nice book uh, on John Reynolds, uh, Fordman, for, Ford, for God's sake. 
And this is uh, done in the 1990s. Excellent coverage again. So, you know, you might ask, what is there left to learn about rentals? Well, uh, with anything, you know, there's always more scholarship taking place. So modern scholarship, if you will. And um, when you revisit some of the original research, you can dig down a little further. Amazing collection at Franklin and Marshall in Lancaster and uh, able to dig down there and revisit some of the letters and pull out some new things. So I'm very proud of the fact that in the book, we're able to go into John's life uh, as a youth uh, at West Point uh, and pull out a few new things, but uh, especially with the Mexican War and his army life and his time in the Civil War. Uh, as I mentioned, some new scholarship and then also working with uh, historians who have uh, created some of this modern scholarship to, uh, to double check things, to look a little further and, and look into his actions in Mexico, look into his actions in the Seven Days, um, Beaver Dam Creek and what have you, Mechanicsville. And then finally, uh, look into his actions at Second Manassas. And then when you get into the Civil War, of course, um, aside from um, Seven Days in Manassas, you're gonna begin to look at the situations where he's now in uh, Corps Command, so Fredericksburg. And we take a close look at that too. So finally, uh, you get around to Gettysburg and uh, revisiting that as well. And as everyone knows, there's continual scholarship on the Battle of Gettysburg. So bringing in a few things there. And, and then of course, looking at the man himself, uh, John Reynolds, his concern for uh, his family, which was very strong. So um, let, me, let me go down here and uh, take another slide because should have jumped over here. Um, familial concerns, I list this here. Uh, about the uh, fourth thing down. John, amazing. Uh, you know, the man's in the army. He's got enough on his mind dealing with the soldiers and the situations he's in, whether it's at peacetime or warfare. Always concerned about his parents' welfare. Always concerned about his sister's welfare, especially after his parents pass. And so you'll see this in his letters continually. And then uh, brothers in arms. I'll put that, or brother in arms, excuse me, his brother, William always concerned about his brother as well. And to me, that, that stood out and something that maybe wasn't drawn upon, uh, certainly mentioned in some of the prior scholarship, but I thought it was worth uh, really highlighting uh, that aspect of John's personality. Um, so um, John's experiences, certainly um, his uh, numerous brushes with death, uh, something that I hadn't mentioned yet, but something that I delve into in detail in the book. A lot of people, you know, will look at it and go, oh, my gosh, uh, John's killed at Gettysburg and and it's terrible. And it certainly is. But I think you'd be surprised if you look at this, how many times John narrowly escaped death and men to serve under uh, comment on this comment. Uh, you know, how long is it going to be before his luck runs out? And of course, we know it does run out at Gettysburg, unfortunately. But uh, there's an instance where he's uh, uh, actually on leave when a number of men in the third artillery who he's serving with uh, prior to the Civil War are gonna ship out of New York, uh, headed for uh, the West Coast. And they're on a brand new ship, the SS San Francisco. And uh, for all intents and purposes, John could have been on the ship. Well, this ship leaves, uh, I believe it's December 22nd. Uh, and within a day or two, this ship is gonna founder off the coast of Delaware. And a uh, horrific storm, uh, not a hurricane, that's been misunderstood over the years. This is an extra tropical storm, probably a nor'easter. Nonetheless, uh, mountainous waves, uh, part of the deck house is washed aside, um, and it's a terrible situation on board the vessel here, and a number of men died. Could have been John. Uh, later on, John's on another ship, the SS, Cali uh, SS California. He's actually on this ship, uh, coming into... Uh, the river there uh, just outside uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, the Columbia River, and coming across the bar, which is infamous for being one of the most treacherous uh, river entries in the world. And sure enough, that ship uh, founders, uh, loses one of the boilers and nearly sinks. And uh, John couldn't believe it. Uh, the, the men go to work, the army men, they're on board the vessel with civilians and save this thing, but uh, nearly lost there as well. So uh, then of course the Civil War, a number of instances where he's out in front leading troops heroically, waving the flag, a regimental flag, urging the troops into action. A great example, certainly at Second Manassas, actually two times, and could have been an easy target. Wouldn't have to be a sharpshooter to get him, but he lives to tell about it. 
So uh, I think that's something that a lot of people haven't realized that, that we bring out in the book. And, and I mentioned the images, you'll see in the book images of uh, these ships I uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, the SS San Francisco, the SS California. I wanted everybody to be able to see these things as I discovered them and share that with you. So shifting gears here for a minute, and uh, I'll just grab a sip of water here. We're gonna talk about Kate. Better understanding of Kate's challenges in life. And everybody uh, that knows anything about this story had understood that uh, Reynolds' remains were examined uh, shortly after uh, he's killed. And it was found that his uh, West Point ring was missing. And uh, on his uh, pinky finger uh, was a small gold ring that inside was inscribed, Dear Kate. Also around his neck was a silken cord with a uh, heart, sacred heart metal, we believe in all likelihood, but a cross, uh, perhaps a crucifix, in all likelihood, I think a crucifix, but either way it's described as a cross and a heart. And uh, this was something a little unusual for a Presbyterian. Uh, and there were some, um, some perplexed individuals. Well, it was only a few days later, actually early morning of, uh, July 3rd, 1863, um, that Kate Hewitt makes her way to the family home, uh, sister's home in Philadelphia, right off Rittenhouse Square, introduces herself and unfolds a story for the family that she is indeed secretly engaged to John Reynolds and she had given him these items, the small ring, uh, the um, cross around the neck and the heart, and, and he had given her his West Point ring. So we knew that much about her. Uh, and we also knew that uh, she had promised John she would enter a religious life. I say that a lot of people say enter the convent. Enter the convent uh, turns out to be wrong because uh, Kate goes with the Daughters of Charity. Uh, they don't call it a convent, uh, nor do they call it an order. A lot of people say religious order. So these are some of the semantics, if you will, that we point out in the book. But it's a community with the Daughters of Charity. Uh, and she will indeed uh, live up to her promise and begin that. Not long after, uh, she does a period of postulancy in the fall of 1863, but formally uh, the process will begin, will begin in earnest in March, actually the 17th of March, 1864. There is a communication that takes place about eight days after he's killed to begin that process. Some had said she actually began the process and no, actually found this uh, letter, a uh, copy of it, excuse me, uh, that was located uh, in the archives originally to Daughters of Charity, mentioning that uh, Kate had a desire to begin the process. But anyway, Kate Hewitt, in and of herself, is one of the most amazing stories of perseverance and triumph over adversity that you'll ever learn about. And I was uh, just blown away the more I researched what she went through in her life of how she could continually pick herself up off the mat. I say knock down here time and again refusing to give up. That is Kate Hewitt in a nutshell, an orphan uh, early on in her life, figures out how to overcome that. Sent to California to work as a governess. Something happens there. It doesn't go well. Finds herself on her own and ends up in a lifestyle that maybe she would have never dreamt she was in, would be in, excuse me. Somehow, somehow figures out a way to get out of this lifestyle. And now she's going to come back east and begin the process to become a Catholic. And so time again, time again, she's knocked out, gets up. And here she is, meets John Reynolds on the voyage back to the East Coast. On the SS Golden Age, brings them from San Francisco, California, July 21st, down to Panama, where they cross the Isthmus via train, wagon, and end up coming up the East Coast. The East Coast, ironically, the SS North Star bringing them home, if you will, to a new beginning. And so Kate Hewitt now meets the love of her life, a secret engagement. But sure enough, John's going to be killed. And that promise she made will have to be fulfilled and enter a religious life. But the challenges don't end there for Kate Hewitt. Because after a few years with the Daughters of Charity, she'll leave mysteriously. And there's been a lot of work done on this over the years. And I tip my hat to everyone that's come before me and unsurfaced some of these things. Uh, so I stand on all their shoulders. And one researcher discovered a document that indicated that she had been asked to leave. I saw the document, also found it, and that was the truth. She was asked to leave the Daughters of Charity. 
So what does she do? do? Now, this is after she had gone to Albany, New York to uh, work as a governess. She will leave uh, and become a teacher on her own. And this is when she has an opportunity uh, by the time she's there with the Daughters of Charity and then on her own, finally to develop another relationship. And she does while she's an independent teacher there in what they called select schools, basically private schools at the time, uh, and uh, falls in love with a local florist. Likely she had come into contact with him uh, while she was uh, serving with the Daughters of Charity there with the church and the school uh, with the florist business. But um, Joseph Ford and Kate fall in love and get married. But there's one more challenge in Kate's life, and that had been haunting her for years. And we know it today is uh, tuberculosis. She was suffering with consumption. You see this in the letters she wrote to John Reynolds' sisters when she's with the Daughters of Charity, and sure enough, the cause of death, consumption, uh, just a few years later uh, after she married. So again, one challenge after another. Uh, nice little side story. Uh, Kate becomes famous in the area or surrounding Albany for her uh, amazing ability with embroidery work. And her embroidery work is second to none. And she's asked to create a banner for the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876. That banner hung in the women's hall there. And it was so remarkable that a number of folks commented on it. And one particular article in the Chicago Tribune, which is quoted in the book, uh, gives it the most glowing uh, review you'll ever read anywhere about some such uh, um, banner, I think. And uh, ironically, talk about Kate's challenges. On her deathbed is the date upon which an award is given to Kate Hewitt for her remarkable banner. So uh, it's, uh, it's almost fitting that it would go this way, but it's sad and tragic indeed. So these are the things that uh, I learned in the book and um, any number of other things in, in any aspect of what I described here, there's layer upon layer upon layer of the research done that I'll, I'll cover in the book. And of course, detail in the end notes, but uh, little things like how did we know about Kate and an orphan? She, she mentions a brother to uh, the Reynolds family. And sure enough, she does have a brother and his name is Benjamin and able to locate primary source documents linking Benjamin to Kate and actually find his grave in the Owego area. So we know a lot about that. The school where Kate might have attended. Um, also things like um, Kate's California uh, sojourn, more information about that. There's been some confusion of who she might've worked with out there or for as a governess. We believe we've corrected that once and for all. Information about Kate's misadventure. And uh, I'll lay it out there for you. She enters a life of prostitution. She's also embroiled in a, uh, a really scandalous affair with a local uh, individual of prominence. And so those things get covered in the press. And there's a reporter on the vessel uh, that Kate uh, boards to come back east, the same vessel John's on. And he makes mention of uh, Kate being there uh, as Kate Wentworth. Kate Wentworth is her alias. Uh, we're able to do the research to uh, triangulate things and identify her in census reports in Sacramento. That's where uh, Kate would uh, spend those years of, uh, of misadventure, if you will, but ultimately leaving. there. So those type of things, there's layer upon layer of the research, the ships are on, uh, the list of passengers, every little aspect that I think uh, anyone with a historian's eye will appreciate, yet we keep the narrative to the point where you're not burdened too much with that um, because it's not a novel, but we wanted it to read in a fashion that those that aren't serious historians, those that aren't, those that might pick up a book on Gettysburg ordinarily might be drawn to the story. Because remember, we want to stick with the facts, but we want to sow them in a way that will improve interest in the battle and also help people. Remember, remember what happened at Gettysburg. Rudyard Kipling said it best. If history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And so at Gettysburg, as a guide, certainly as a historian, you constantly ask yourself, do you want to be a historian? Do you want to be a storyteller?
And really, I think if you want to be the consummate guy, the consummate historian, you're going to tell history accurately, but you're going to include stories that help people remember, remember what you want them to remember. But what we want them to remember at Gettysburg is what happened here. The world will little know, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. President Abraham Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address. Hopefully, Gettysburg's lost love story will help you, once you read this book, better remember what they, in this case, John and Kate, did here. Never forget. Sometimes when I sign books for people, I'll throw that in there. And as you can tell from our time together here, hopefully, is something I truly hope you don't do. It's just too much that happened at Gettysburg, and there are many, many, many stories, stories yet to be told and written about, I'm sure, and many that are already written about and exist. But hopefully, again, this book, my book, Gettysburg's Lost Stubble, Love Story, excuse me, The Ill-Fated Romance of General John Reynolds and Kate Hewitt, I hope you remember what happened here. Let me conclude with a little bit of information here for you. Uh, the book is available at Arcadia Publishing. Uh, of course, it's available in many places online, many local places in town uh, at Gettysburg and in most major retailers. So wherever books are sold, probably the best way to, to say that. Uh, I've got my contact information here. The best way to reach me right now is through the publisher. They're handling a lot of my events and what have you. I'm definitely available for tours, uh, speaking engagements, podcasts, uh, leadership seminars, etc. Uh, I've got a couple other books in the works I'd like to let you know about. Uh, one is about the weather at Gettysburg. Uh, those of you that follow some of what I've been researching might be aware that uh, we finally discovered what the heat index was, humidity and dew point during the Battle of Gettysburg. It's recently published an article in Gettysburg Magazine on that. A perfect storm of heat, and there will be a book to follow. And again, the book I mentioned earlier that I'm still working on, Navy and Gettysburg Connections. So a couple of those things coming down the line. Um, if things turn out the way I hope. Uh, Death by Dew Point, another article that just came out in Civil War Times uh, discussing the uh, weather in Virginia during the Civil War in two important periods of time, one during the Gettysburg campaign. And I think you might enjoy this because we take the methodology we used to examine heat index at the Battle of Gettysburg using never before used primary source data, uh, weather observation data from nearby Gettysburg, um, and in this case, for the uh, story of Virginia, we're using uh, never before used data from the Washington, D.C. area and uh, doing our uh, diligence to make sure that what D.C. would have been would have been in the areas in Virginia we talked about by comparing modern uh, data to make sure that uh, our analysis holds water. Uh, Anchors away at Gettysburg, Navy Gettysburg Connections, Navy History Magazine. A monumental mystery, 78th, 102nd, one of my favorite monuments on the battlefield. Others have uh, looked into this as well, but I was fortunate to uh, get involved in this and be able to publish a, a magazine article in Gettysburg Magazine, January 2021. Uh, Finding Kate, this is the article I mentioned with Mary Pitkin, Civil War Times. And then um, interesting uh, aspect of some of my research, I'm into World War II research as well, especially Pacific uh, theater. And the battles of Midway and Gettysburg share some remarkable similarities and you can uh, find that online, Gettysburg Experience Magazine article uh, recently published. Uh, I did one in June 2020, but it's been republished uh, for the most part, June 2022. So you can look for it there. And then Pieces of the Past, another history mystery, if you will. Uh, Admiral Nimitz, who signed the uh, surrender um, in uh, Tokyo Bay on behalf of the United States when the Japanese surrendered. MacArthur signs for the Allies, Nimitz for the United States. Well, he used two pens. One was in a museum at the Naval Academy. One had been lost to history, got involved with that a number of years ago and working with the team that included a descendant of the man who gave the pen to Nimitz and with the wish that he would sign a surrender someday with it. And also the grandson of Admiral Nimitz uh, put a team together there and we were able to locate this pen. So there's an article about it uh, in Naval History Magazine, September, 2019 in a column they call Pieces of the Past. So just a few little other things. Hopefully I've covered enough of uh, what I wanted to say here today uh, to keep your interest in, in looking into reading my book. I hope you do. Uh, one last thing I'd like to say is nothing like this ever gets done 
without a team. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work, right? No greater example than this book. If you read the acknowledgments, maybe longer than the acknowledgments in many books you read, but I wanted to make sure to tip my hat to those that helped me. This book was written for the most part during uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic. And so uh, I really relied upon archivists, uh, and colleagues, historians far and wide, friends, you name it. Um, so please, uh, if you get the book, read the acknowledgments. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to all of those uh, that assist me in the process. The book doesn't get done without them. So my name's on the book cover, but all of them share in any success uh, and meaning uh, that the book brings to folks that read it. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything. All the best of health to everyone. Take care and be safe. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate that. I was um, really enjoying all the information about Kate and uh, John Reynolds there. I love that story. And thank you to everyone who watched our program. Like I mentioned before, if you liked it, please like, share, subscribe, all those um, awesome words everybody likes to say now because it makes us feel fancy. Um, but I hope you all have a great week. We will see you next Thursday for another program. And thank you so much for supporting Adams County Historical Society.